by working together. We can win. I've been to five war zones, places like Afghanistan, Colombia, Somalia. This is the site where Black Hawk Down occurred. Where guns are the common currency. That truck and it's got a huge machine gun pointed right at our car. I've shopped at arms bazaars around the world where people can buy an AK-47 easier than they can get food. This is an RPG, right? How much is this one right here? One hundred and fifty dollars. And it's easy in these faraway, dangerous places to marvel at the sight of an eight-year-old kid carrying a grenade launcher and think, what a wild world we live in. But it's a myth, because when it comes to the number of guns, America is the wildest place in the world. I've just come into the evidence vault of the Camden Police Department. We're here just to show you the kind of stuff uh, that's been taken off the streets in Camden. So I set off on a journey across America, from the heartland to the hotland. Knob Creek, Kentucky, to the most dangerous city in America, Camden, New Jersey, to see how the proliferation of guns is shaping the country. Go ahead. This is fully automatic America. Okay, so here I am, I'm just outside of Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm headed to Knob Creek Gun Range for the country's biggest machine gun shoot. Should be a good time. Apparently you can shoot anything there. Class three weapons, automatic weapons, flamethrowers, all kinds of stuff. So this is kind of like uh, Disneyland for gun enthusiasts. And uh, we're heading off to go see the rides. How come I feel like I'm on my way to like the militia headquarters or something? There's like dudes in camo waving me through. Hey, we're supposed to meet uh, Chad Sumner. Do you know where we would meet him? Uh, who are y'all with? With current, current TV. TV. They're supposed to meet Sparky. Sparky. When you come here, it's just like an Oscar party or something. They give you free stuff. So, but the swag here is stuff like small arms review, the shotgun news, and uh, posters of this girl. <laughs> You're a pro. You're deaf at this place. <laughs> Already, like, some huge cannon thing went off. Rattled. <laughs> Rocked our worlds. Here, man, slip a couple of these in oh. your breast pocket. Got it, thanks. Like I said, you can shoot anything you want here. <laughs> Knob Creek, the country's biggest machine gun shoot. It's kind of like a festival celebrating gun ownership. Guns, a controversial issue in American politics and society for sure. But here, the sentiment is clear. Guns are a way of life, and we came to check out the lifestyle. Any guns? Any guns? What you see right here next to me is pretty rare. You won't find this at a lot of places in the country, but here, just outside of Louisville, Kentucky, has some of the least restrictive gun laws in the nation. So machine gun enthusiasts get together here to fire off basically about anything you can think of. up on the firing line, in my opinion, it's like the ultimate treat. I'm in the gun business 24-7. Coming here, is, it's, there's no other way to describe it. It's, it's awesome. I'm originally from New York City where you can't do anything. I mean, you can't own a slingshot or a water pistol unless it's orange. And we end up moving out to Pennsylvania to get away from that. And even that state, which is a fairly free state, you can shoot, but you can't shoot like you can shoot here in West Point, Kentucky. Jack, how 
old are you? Nine. Nine? And uh, how long have you been shooting the 50 cow? Uh, probably about three times I've come up here. So who brought you here? My mom and my grandfather. Where's your grandpa? Right there. For you, there's value in bringing your grandson out and teaching him about guns and teaching him to shoot. You know, kids that, kids that fool around out here with these things, you don't have any trouble out of them. They got all aggression already out of their system. After talking with some of the patrons of the show, I went to talk to Chad Sumner, the third generation owner of the Knob Creek gun range. So tell me about the history of this event. Tell me about Knob Creek. Well, Knob Creek, my grandpa bought this from Naval Ordnance. Naval Ordnance was the Naval Test Range, five inch. The big gun, you know, big Naval guns. They did shoot 16 inch guns here. Now we're to this. 15,000 people, a whole firing line full of machine guns. So, so who are these guys? Like, who are your patrons? They're gun enthusiasts, they're collectors? Collectors, lawyers, just, you know, hobbyists. It's not cheap, you know. It's not cheap to have this hobby. Yeah, tell me about that. You're telling me that there's a gun out here that's worth 75 grand? Yeah, 75 grand, you know. Bell fit 50 right there, right. almost 60 now. M M60, 30,000. My favorite would probably be the minigun. You know what's so crazy about this, you guys, is like, so these are electrically operated. That's what these handles are. You fly it like an airplane. Normally these are mounted on like a helicopter. Like they, they're hanging outside the doors of like a, a 60 Blackhawk or something and up and down and, and around. Wow. Never, never seen one of these on, <laughs> at a gun range before. Hey, you can buy them. You can buy one? Yeah, there's a few. I can imagine these, what it costs. I can guarantee that's probably going to be about $250,000, $300,000. Kentucky's a class three state, right? Yes. And what's that mean exactly? You can have anything that's classified as full auto, one pull of the trigger, and empty a clip. A lot of people don't know that these are law-abiding citizens, and it takes a lot of paperwork and time to get this stuff. None of these guys got criminal records, and most of them have never been to jail. So you got to fly the straight and narrow to have this stuff. Just to possess one of these things without the right paperwork is a you know, $250,000 fine and 20 year jail So the range is about to go hot again right now, which means that uh, all these guys down the firing line are going to start blasting off. We're going to head out to the range right now and try and rent a machine gun and blast off a few rounds. Hey, Chris Bay, who's a good person to rent from? Oh, he's got a for rent sign. Right there's one. Okay. That and the guy down there at the end, little fat boy. When we get going, it's um, $100 to shoot 25 rounds of the 50. Okay. And uh, $80 to shoot 100 rounds of the 308. Knob Creek reads like a military history of America. Sometime when it gets dirty, it won't load. It's got the M16 standard issue in Vietnam. Even the Gatling gun, used by the Union Army during the Civil War. All of this sits side by side with the latest in military technology. Tell me about what you were shooting today. Well, earlier in the day I was shooting a 249. It's the same weapon that's being used in Iraq, Afghanistan, and it's a hell of a gun. It's used the same round as an M16, 5.56. It fires around eight to 900 rounds a minute, depending on the configuration it's set up in. And it's just a hell of a gun. When I was in high school, they had the Columbine shooting and everything. Some people kind of looked at me like, "Yeah, what's he gonna do?" But I'm a gun nut, you know. But there's a difference between me and those kids. And, you know, a difference between somebody that is taught how to use these guns and understand. Besides, some kid that said, you know. I'm just gonna go kill people because I saw it on TV or you know played a video game. Outside the main line, the attractions here kind of mimic war situations, from the chance to shoot from a helicopter to the jungle walk. You get to use my Uzi, so all right. It's been a while for me, so it's great. You know, a little bit of a little bit of my old life coming back out. 18 targets and 50 rounds. You gotta look for them, but they are obvious when you do find them. Uh-oh. 
getting hot. That's a grill can. They're cooking their rice and beans, and we showed up and they took off. All right, so another big part of the Knob Creek Gun Show is um, the vendor tent, which basically, as the owner of the event told us, like, if you can't find it here, like, you can't find it. They're selling anything and everything to do with guns, machine guns, weapons, knives, accessories, all that stuff. So you can see behind me, and you can see down the line here, that there's just hundreds of vendors selling all the accessories. Come here, come check this out. Automatic grenade launcher. So like, if you press down on the, the trigger there, it goes soup, 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 soup. You can launch these things hundreds of meters downrange. It's like a machine gun for grenades. And they just go boom, 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 boom. Exploding everywhere. It's, uh, it's everywhere you'd want to be. <laughs> Little product placement. But to advocates of stricter gun control, it's shows like this one which are a big part of the problem. They want tougher laws governing the buying and selling of weapons. But even the laws themselves can be problematic sometimes. The gun laws and the gun legislation is extraordinarily complex. So for example, in most states, this would be a legal barrel to have as your part of your AR-15 part of your machine gun, whereas this one, this 10 and a quarter inch barrel, would not be legal, right? So general rule of thumb is that the smaller barrels tend to be illegal and the longer barrels tend to be legal. Knob Creek County is a place filled with contradiction. Well, we thank you for the blessings you give us, Lord, through our life, all the great things you have prepared for us, Lord. Where Bible Belt conservatism and guns are a tradition that are passed down from generation to generation. A lot of people don't realize that it was guns that helped us keep our country the way it is. If you take our guns away and nobody, like any, all these law-abiding citizens don't have any guns, well, who's the only ones that have guns? You got cops and robbers. So what, what good does that do? It's not, you know, uh, well, what if they break in my house? Boom, boom, I'm dead. You know, I didn't have nothing to protect myself. So you like shooting? Yes. And what do you think about girls shooting? I think all women should be shooting. At least try it once. It's like a new food. It's something that every girl should try. Look at this woman shooting right here. So now we're going to go look at the results of what thousands of rounds of lead downrange does. These are just like old like propane tanks or helium tanks or something. They're just like I'm shot to shit. They want to see their canvas when they're done. Like these are professionals, right? They want to see their their masterpiece when it's over. <laughs> this is this is their canvas that these that these dudes paint on. Safety, that's full auto here. Single fire at the safety. You just came out for the shoot? Yeah, we've been coming down here for quite a few years. Uh, I haven't missed it in 17 years. You guys excited? Yeah. You amped? Nice. <laughs> we, we got full auto at home, so we kind of play around with it on our, we got a little mini range behind our house we shoot and right. things like that. So, uh, but the only thing we don't have is a flamethrower. We don't have a flamethrower. <laughs> <laughs> There's always Christmas. <laughs> One of the most popular items to shoot at the show wasn't even a gun. It was a flamethrower fueled by napalm. Like, what do you use a flamethrower for tactically? Uh, historically, they were used to route the enemy from uh, fortified positions uh, in the Pacific. Primarily, the, the use of the flamethrower was not necessarily to, to burn the enemy. It was more or less to route them from their fortifications by asphyxiation. Would you like to try? I'm down. Um, I'm getting dressed in this space gear right now. <laughs> I feel a little ridiculous, but it's all right. Okay, I'm gonna set it down in your back. I got your back, buddy. Don't worry. We're right behind you. Your little twin shooters. Yeah. This is your ignition system. Yep, that one first. Yep. That's what you want to hear. The reason you want it on the side, you're shooting napalm and it's uh, semi-solid. Yep. Sticky, gooey. Yep. And if you stop firing, there'll be some unburnt residue in here. You want to squeeze this hard and deliberately.
miss the fire. Walk through it. Right? Yeah. It was incredible. I don't know about standing with the napalm tank in the, in the middle of the burning fire, but I guess it's empty. That is so much fun. That is, did you see me torching that thing? I had spent three days in Knob Creek, seen everything shot from nine millimeters to 50 cal machine guns. Literally, the sky's the limit here. You know why this place is wild? Is because every time you think you've seen it all, then some dude shows up with his own tank, and starts blasting away. to take his neighborhood watch to the next level. We take it serious in our neighborhood. Most people don't know you can even own one of these guns. And hopefully we can educate them saying, you can own that. You know, you just gotta fly the straight and narrow. As I got ready for the night shoot, the grand finale of this event, I thought about the role of guns in America. Regardless of how you feel about them, they are a part of the fabric of American society. As our time in Knob Creek ended, I was able to put aside the controversy for a second and enjoy Knob Creek's homage to what they consider an integral part of the American idea. There's another side to the issue of guns in America. For every legal gun we saw at Knob Creek, there's a countless pool of illegal guns that make their way onto the streets of American cities. One of those cities plagued by gun violence is Camden, New Jersey. A stone's throw across the river from downtown Philadelphia in 2005 and 2006, Camden was rated the most dangerous city in America. It's a city suffering from crime, much of it gun-related. One of the highest per capita murder rates, thousands of guns seized each year, and gun-related crime make it the perfect place to look at another side of American gun culture. My vessel for exploring Camden, the U.S. Marshal Service. Marshals are one of the most elite law enforcement agencies in the world. They set up a special task force to deal with the particular cauldron that is Camden. The Marshals agreed to be my eyes and my ears for checking out the streets of Camden. They took me into their world, where guns are an everyday reality. Lenny DePaul, I'm the commander of the New York, New Jersey Regional Fugitive Task Force. I'm Bill Plitt, I'm the uh, deputy commander of the United States Marshals, uh, New York, New Jersey Regional yeah, Task Force. Can you guys just give me some background on the Marshal Service? Well, the Marshal Service being the oldest uh, federal law enforcement agency, uh, 1789, uh, we do a variety of law enforcement. We have the witness protection program, prisoner transport, judicial uh, protection assignments, and so on. The specific uh, regional fugitive task force, we target the more dangerous, violent, felony fugitives throughout the country. Uh, whether it be a homicide, a shooting, rape, uh, whatever the case, it's turned over to us. Uh, we're batting a thousand so far. UMP 40. That's a Rock River 223. Uh, wanted out of Kansas City for uh, ag assault, uh, teenage and welfare of a child. Uh, he gets a beef with a girl on the 1800 block of South 8th, uh, grabs by the neck, starts choking her. Um, I went by the house, uh, by the apartment this morning. Uh, the car registered to him is parked out there. Uh, we got two guys out now sitting on the car, uh, make sure it doesn't leave. All right, so this morning they're doing a big sweep of, um, they're going to try and pick up seven or eight guys. They're going to hit seven or eight houses. And what they do is they, everybody gets together. In the morning they do a quick brief, but it's like down and dirty. Here's the house, here's how we're going in. Like, let's go grab the guy. 
because of the nature of violence in Camden. Like when they go, they come with a big footprint, which is like 14 guys, the shields, the dogs, right? Whole caravan of cars. That's what we're doing this morning. Informant got a location where uh, the guy was laying his head last night. So right now we're uh, we're about to go uh, make entry on the house. The owner of the house also has some warrants, so it, it gives us a, a right to uh, to gain entry anyway, whether uh, they uh, consent to entry or forced entry. Here we go. Same thing last week, different house. The guy had an AK-47 on him, right? So because of the kind of firepower that they're seeing on the streets of Camden, right, they can't afford to take any chances. That's why you see him geared up, going in, uh, fully prepared as if anything could happen. Police, come to the front door. Come to the front door. It's a bummer to see these guys, like, you know, go into this house at, you know, early in the morning and try and pull this guy out and, like, first like three people that we've seen come out are like kid going to school and like little six-year-old kid you know, it sucks it sucks we continued an entire morning nabbing suspects with the marshals we went on seven raids arrested four suspects two of them for assaults that involved weapons but despite the arrests it felt a little bit like digging a hole in water you take one suspect or one gun off the street but it just seems like there's another one rushing in to fill the void. So I went to talk to some of the local community groups to find out how this panorama of guns and violence is brutalizing Camden. I know these youngsters, they're not getting the guns from Camden. No. Okay, they're getting it from Philadelphia. I don't know how they bring them over here, but that's a big problem. But does it really matter where the guns are coming from? Like the bottom line is people are getting shot, right? People are getting shot, but in the state of New Jersey, the gun laws are much stricter than they are in Pennsylvania. Exactly. And when you have the accessibility of getting a gun right over the bridge, I mean, you, you know, logistically, Camden sits right on the border of Philadelphia. So while, you know, the guns may not be the biggest problem, the fact that they're much harder to get in New Jersey by jet, you can go five minutes across the bridge and have a, you know, a straw purchase or buy a gun and bring it back and sell it to a 15-year-old on our street, that's a problem. That's a big problem. So we went five minutes across the bridge to Philadelphia to talk to a gun dealer who's been heavily criticized because of the high number of straw purchases coming out of his shop. Straw purchases are like the shoulder tapping of gun buying. Someone buys a gun legally, then passes it on to someone else illegally. Calissimo's, a longtime Philadelphia gun shop, was once ranked by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms as one of the worst places for straw purchasing in the country. Hey, how you doing, man? How's it going? This is the famous uh, Calissimo's? Yes, it is. All right. Can I see one of the HKs? Uh-huh. woo -hoo! How much does this run? Eight ninety-five. Yeah, sure, absolutely. You take this one off the rack? Yeah. Target gun. What's this uh, shooting a 223? 223. For shooting targets. I've been in business 57 years. My family has been in this business going back, I think, to 1917. Where do those um, guns that are being used in crimes in 
uh, take Camden again, for example, where do those guns come from? Stolen guns. Stolen. Not from a legitimate gun dealer. They do not come from a legitimate gun dealer. At some point, though, they start from a legitimate gun dealer. They originate. They originated, but after they're stolen, they're not legitimate guns. They're stolen guns. Is there an issue if, um, if somebody buys a gun who clears legally and then, but suppose they then give that gun to someone else? Well, then the, that's the person that's violating the law. I mean, not the dealer. Do you, as a gun shop dealer, as the owner of a gun shop, bear any responsibility for those guns that end up on the street? No, I don't. And I don't feel the least bit guilty about those guns because I did not put them on the street. Because the guns that I sold were sold legitimately. These were guns that were either were stolen or sold by the individuals. No. I do not, and I don't think any other dealer feels that he bears any responsibility for it. See, they're trying to, they're trying to legislate on guns, right? It's not the guns, it's the people that use them. Guns do not kill people, it's people kill people. Well, actually, Mr. Clisimo, it's bullets that kill people. So next stop, Cooper General Hospital in central Camden to see quite literally the impact of a bullet on the body. Meet Dr. Ross, 20 year veteran of trauma surgery at Cooper General. In Camden, he's considered the guru of gunshot wounds. So when a, when a bullet actually enters the body, what's going on? What's causing the damage? Well, they, uh, there's direct physical damage to the tissues just by the, the bullet entering, uh, causing cutting forces. But because uh, a bullet carries a lot of kinetic energy, the, the energy from the, from the load exploding, uh, it causes a shock wave through the tissues. And a higher energy missile, either one that's fairly large, like you, you know, talk about 45 caliber or something like that, or something high velocity, like either a, a deer rifle or a military rifle, uh, causes uh, its damage by an expanding shock wave through the tissue. So the, if the injury isn't always as apparent with a, a high velocity weapon, you know, the kind of things they're seeing in, in Iraq now, as with most civilian weapons. So on the other hand, we still see uh, people who are shot with high velocity weapons here since military weapons tend to creep into into the uh, inner city and deer rifles are you know like a 30 odd six is a high velocity weapon assault weapons are indeed showing up on the streets exhibit a the evidence room All right so what's happening now is uh I've just come into the evidence vault of the Camden Police Department, and we're looking at a series of guns that have been confiscated, basically. And we're here just to show you the kind of stuff uh, that's been taken off the streets in Camden. Uh, to give you an idea of, one, the proliferation of guns in Camden, and two, um, the type of stuff that, you know, the, the people, the cops, the police can all be up against. And as you can see, like, there's, there's hundreds of guns here. You saw when we went out this morning on the raids, everybody's geared up, right? And they go in uh, with a pretty, a pretty heavy uh, force posture, right? This is the reason. It's because welcome to the Camden Evidence Locker. Tons of guns everywhere. This is a Thompson submachine gun right here, bolt action 30-06. Double barrel shotgun. And the hits just keep on rolling. This is an SKS. Here's another AK right here. This has been the fuel and the fire for um, wars in Eastern Europe, Africa, South America. And this is the standard classic revolutionary. Look how many countries around the world, like there are African countries that have the AK-47 on their flag, right? A serious assault rifle. This right here is gonna kill any cop that it goes up against, um, or it's gonna at least pierce his, his vest. Uh, this is really dangerous. So this is, a, this is a, an M16 or an AR-15. It's standard issue to the Marine Corps and the Army. Bottom line, this is an assault rifle. Fires a high velocity bullet. 
This armor can withstand one shot, one shot only. These usually have, you know, 30 round magazines in them. That is really intense that you guys are pulling these kind of things off the street. Because of the types of weapons available, the law enforcement agencies have been forced to increase their firepower as well. So this is creating a virtual arms race in the streets. The marshals have adopted new weapons and new tactics to counter the growing threat. All right, Kenny, so tools of the trade, right? You want to you take us through them? That's our uh, duty-issued weapon for the whole service. That's a Glock 40 caliber. Next is our Taser. That's our less lethal. Next is our uh, UMP, uh, HK UMP 40. Uh, some machine gun, I can drive with it in my lap. And, uh, perfect for entry in small urban environments. Our shotgun, 12 gauge, and uh, a real effective tool. When people see that coming and hear, the, uh, hear you racking around, they just want to give up immediately. We don't prefer to even play a field, we prefer to be above. So this is military grade hardware, right. and you're telling me that there's um, military grade hardware or military like hardware out there on the streets as well. Uh, so, like, what are the consequences, right? I mean, that's that's a lot of lead that's flying in different directions. It's not always hitting its target, right? Well, the consequences are I'm trained fully to use these weapons, and they're not, and as you see, innocent people uh, pay the price for that. We are not a SWAT team, but we train like a SWAT team. We bring professionals to us to train us like a SWAT team, because we do as many high-risk entries as any SWAT team in this country. We do it every day. So we try to prepare as uh, every entry is uh, the most dangerous entry. It's changed out there. I mean, they're playing hardball. They got, and we try to stay ahead of the curve with the firepower that, that we see from AK-47s, the automatic weapons. Uh, and you have to stay ahead of the curve. No sense in bringing a knife to a gunfight. So uh, we need to, we need to be prepared, and that's how we do it. Yeah. So, uh, try to use the element of surprise yeah. to our advantage. Uh, that's the one advantage we do have. Before that one even simmers down, we're walking about. I don't know, say 60, maybe 100 feet down the street, and we're going to do another one, one to the next. We don't adopt cases. We, we work cases with other agencies. They solve their own cases. We look for their people. Because you get a shooting here today in Camden, okay, and, and they get a known doer on that shooting. Well, then we go try to look for that, that doer. All right, guys, real quick. Uh, he is wanted on a FTA warrant out of U.S. District Court here in Camden for a bank robbery. Possible weapon in that house, maybe. Well, we'll do what we just did, shield up, helmets on, uh, bring up the uh, breaching equipment. Sweet professionalized fugitive hunting in the marshal service. This is our art, it's a, it's a skill. And, and departments get on board, they start seeing that, and then their people get trained as better investigators. You have to be a good interviewer, you have to have good tactics on the street, you're almost like a street cop, and then you have to be a great investigator. You know, you gotta think outside the box how to catch these people. The gangs control the flow of guns in Camden, so we went a little deeper into the gang world. Hey, how are you? How are you doing, sir? Kaj Larson. The nice Detective to meet you. Marshall Morgan, Camden Police. Great, great to meet you. What gangs uh, are present here yeah. that you're concerned about? Well, <laughs> we're concerned about all of them, but, <laughs> but uh, our biggest ones that uh, we're looking at is uh, our sex money murder, blood set, the uh, G Shine Bloods. Fruit Town Brims, the uh, nine three headbusters. You know we we have them all here, and pretty much they're all getting along so far. You know unless there's a shortage of drugs, and then everybody wants to start taking over each other's sets. You grew up here. Is that uh, does it does it bug you driving around in senior city like this? Uh, I remember. Uh, Shotgun. 
call for a minute. I need a vehicle stop. They, uh, they just committed something over off of Magnolia and Park. Black vehicle heading towards Wildwood Avenue. Has a shotgun in the vehicle. Now we're heading towards Park. Turn, turn left, turn left, turn left. That vehicle right there, Orlando. With the help of the local Camden PD, we finally arrested the guy in the car. Ironically, it turns out that he was actually a local store owner who had just been robbed and was after the robber. There's always something going down. In Camden, the good guys and the bad guys have guns. I'm a senior parole officer in Camden. I'm in charge of supervising gang members. The socks cap and the orange bandana represents a particular set of the Crips street gang. The SOC stands for slobs on execution. Slob is a derogatory term that the Crips use to refer to the bloods. What exactly is this? This represents um, an officer's handbook. I believe my... An officer, you mean a gang officer's handbook? Yes, because in this particular organization, as in pretty much all of the organizations, they have a leadership structure. Um, Look at this, they have a progress report. If you're under the... If members are under 18, please attach their progress reports, cards to the back of this report. Very often, if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing in their gang, they will conduct beating on site or termination on site. Wait, did you... Did you say termination on site? Yes. What does that mean? They're going to kill you if you don't do what you're supposed to do. I think traditionally it's, uh, there's been more African American gangs here, but I think what you see is a, a shifting of the gang demographic, and it's pretty obvious that the, the Latin gangs are here in full force as well. Chiapas, right? If you look at all the violence right now in Mexico, it's all going down in Chiapas. Nica, Nicaragua. Muertas 13, Death 13. Finally, we went to talk to someone who's trying to remedy crime by getting guns off the street through a variety of policy initiatives and buyback programs. Brian Miller, Executive Director, Ceasefire. Can you tell me uh, how you came to Ceasefire? In November 1994, I got a call one evening that our only brother, FBI Special Agent Mike Miller, had been shot and killed um, earlier that day. The shooter went into D.C. Police Headquarters carrying a, uh, a Mac-10 32 bullet clip, opened a door and started firing. I honor my brother every day, and it's just, uh, the work feels great. Uh, Camden's a city that's plagued by gun violence, is that fair to say? <laughs> yeah, that's very fair to say. It's, uh, it's absolutely devastated by gun violence. What's the mechanism for that? Where are those guns coming from? Who's using them? Paint me a picture of Camden. Well, Camden's got a horrible problem of poverty, uh, no jobs, no industry to, to speak of, um, 80,000 people in a crumbling infrastructure right across the city from a you know, relatively vibrant major metropol uh, metropolis. It's about drugs, and it's about territories, and it's about guns. They had to have purchased the, the gun from a street seller who somehow illegally acquired the, those weapons. Those guns are ending up on the street. Is it common that we see guns purchased over there in Philly 
used in crimes here in Camden? All the time. All the time. All the time. So this is not theory, this is actually happening. Right. How easy is it for a young person here to, to, to get a gun on the street? If you can't get a gun in 10 minutes in Camden, you're not trying? You're asleep. Okay. I've always believed that, that you know, there are just too many guns in American society, and, and with all those guns, they end up being used, and a lot of people get shot and killed. There's over 200 million guns in circulation in this country, and as many as 40% of American households report that they keep a gun in the home. Is this the way it was meant to be? As I walked among the statues of the signers of the Constitution and read the text of the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I reflected on the two Americas I had seen. One where liberty and the pursuit of happiness meant the right to bear arms. And another where bearing arms means depriving someone else of liberty and life. How do we reconcile these two halves? Guns without a doubt contribute to violence in the United States. But who's responsible? These guys? The sport hobbyist? The gangster? The dealer who claims the law protects him from the consequences of his action? The straw purchaser? The manufacturer, it's hard to know where responsibility lies in a chain of events. Ultimately, for better or for worse, the slice of the country we saw is comprised of two cultures, both that worship their guns. Together, they constitute one nation under gun. Fully automatic America. <laughs>